Well, every night I go out running Or riding my bike I like the sweat, I like the flow I get, I like the feeling of the night air Hitting my lungs I like the feeling of rain While sticking out my tongue Sometimes I like to pretend I'm on a secret mission Sometimes I'm just making sure it's not something out there happening That I'm missing and I swear to you I get a real high from it Fuck alcohol and fuck all that shit and fuck TV Let's meet up in our bikes down by the old train bridge I'll race you downtown and I'll show you what you miss from me inside And let's live our lives tonight Let's ride our bikes into the night And let's live our lives tonight And we are recording. Uh, welcome, folks, to the Garrett Schalke podcast. I am uh, your host, Garrett Schalke, on this uh, beautiful Saturday morning slash afternoon. Uh, afternoon here in Michigan, uh, morning over in Nevada. And uh, today's guest is uh, a truly special guest. And I know I say that all the time because I'm a hack, but... Uh, this time I very much mean it, because uh, today's guest is uh, someone that I consider not only a favorite writer of mine, but someone that has had a huge influence on my own work. He is the author of The Human War, The Insurgent, The Collected Works of Noah Cicero, Volumes 1 and 2, Bipolar Cowboy, and his latest work, published through House of Vlad Press, Noah Cicero's Wild Kingdom, which is the main topic of today's show. So, uh, folks, let's uh, give a very warm welcome to, uh, straight from Las Vegas, Nevada, Noah Cicero. Noah, how's it going, man? I'm doing okay. It's just Saturday morning in Las Vegas, very sunny and nice morning. Yeah, I'm uh, glad you could join us, and, uh... Yeah, I guess if you are tired from being up this early, I sincerely apologize. Oh, no, I, I woke up at 6 a.m. It's okay. I already even spent an hour sitting outside of a Starbucks drinking coffee and reading a book. Uh, you're a morning person, then? Yeah, I wake up at, like, 5.45, 6 a.m. every day without any kind of alarm or anything. Oh, really? Yeah, you don't do that? This isn't normal? Uh, well, I have to get up during the week for that, but that's to go to my day job at the warehouse. Other, other than that, uh, like today, I try to get up around like 10 o'clock or so. <laughs> wow, I haven't slept at 10 o'clock in a decade. Yeah, I mean, that's crazy. Well, it used to be much later, you know, back when I was young, wild, and free, and you know, didn't have to get up at, like, 5 in the morning to go to work. But, uh... Oh, wow. But, yeah, this is, like, the latest I can, like, sleep in now on my own. You know, it's over... It's been nearly a decade now since I started my warehouse job, and, uh... Yeah, it's kind of become part of me to get up earlier now. Yeah, I don't know what happened. Like, I, uh... In my 30s, I just started waking up earlier and earlier and earlier, and, like, it seems like every year I'm getting, like, 15 minutes earlier. But I remember my father, when I was little, would wake up at, like, 5 a.m., and I'm like, fuck, I'm just become like, maybe that's my genetic rotation or whatever it is. Man, uh, I remember when I was a little kid, I, uh, would get up really early. First, it was because of, you know, Saturday morning cartoons. There's that. Then, uh, then for some reason I wanted to, like, try to be, like, my dad in that aspect and get up early. And, uh, didn't really work well since I would just sit there and watch whatever crap was on TV and fall asleep in the chair. <laughs> fall asleep in the chair. That's funny. I like Saturday morning cartoons when I was little. Yeah, I know. It's, man, it's a shame they got wiped out. Though I have, I have seen advertisements, though, for a place called 
cartoon channel, spelled with a K, where they advertise Saturday morning cartoons on Saturday mornings. <laughs> I've never heard of the channel or anything. Nah, that's... I, didn't even know, I, I didn't even know they were wiped out or anything. Oh, yeah, they've been, like, long gone. Unless you count, like, oh. I don't know, like, Nickelodeon or Cartoon Network. I'm, I'm talking about, like, Saturday mornings, like, NBC, Fox, and all that stuff. Those are long gone. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. All right, uh, Noah. Yeah, man. Uh, yeah. yeah, thanks for joining us. Uh, how you been? Oh, I'm okay. I'm, I'm, like, alive and stuff. Uh, th that's very good to know. Uh, I prefer my <laughs> guests to be alive. Yeah, I'm like alive. I'm like making it through. It's okay. Uh, yeah, same here, man. It's been a pretty rough year, to to say the least, for everyone. And uh, yeah, it's slightly getting better, but not by much. No, it doesn't feel like it's getting better. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't feel like it. Maybe, maybe, I mean, like, I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe things will get better. Well, let's uh, talk about something better then. Uh, <laughs> good transition there, huh? All that right. sounds good. Yeah, uh, let's talk about your uh, latest work, your latest book. It's an autobiographical poetry tome called uh, Noah Cicero's Wild Kingdom. Yeah, uh, can you uh, summarize what Wild Kingdom is about? Um, so there's a guy and he is, it's during quarantine and he's with his new wife and he like lives in Las Vegas and he met his wife in Las Vegas and she doesn't know anything about his childhood in Ohio. And, um, as they're sitting there, you know, cause they, I don't know, I can't, I don't know if I specify, but like they're not going to work or something or they're working from home. Like their imagination can do whatever it needs with that. Mm -hmm. And so he, she just like goes, tell me about your childhood. And he just starts telling her the stories of like little clip the moments, kind of like, <laughs> you know, the moments when you're a child and you feel a sense of wonder mm -hmm. and you're kind of like conscious of something for the first time and like, what does it mean? Like, why is this thing here? Why is this in my life kind of feeling? And then it, it kind of goes through all of that and goes through pretty much like age four to about, um, I think like 12 or so. And you just like kind of, there's just a bunch of little poems there's like a lot of them. There's like over 50 of them, like little poems about all these little moments that the, the child has in their little world. And it's like, um, the little, cause when you're a child, it's like, you're so sheltered, you know, mm -hmm. you just live in whatever world your parents give you. And so it just goes through these little moments. All right. All right. And, uh, yeah, I have, uh, read it this, uh, past week. And, uh, well, I'll just say right off the bat that I loved it, just as I have your previous, uh, poetry books. No, it's a... Oh, good, thank you. No, very, very, a very smooth read, and, uh, a very gripping narrative, and, uh, just a lot of scenarios and topics that, uh, well, that you presented in a lot of your past work that I very much enjoyed. But, uh... One thing I noticed uh, right away in comparison to your previous books, you know, Bipolar Cowboy and Nature Documentary, is that you uh, base the poems within a larger narrative. You know, the character Tom, describing his youth in a... Uh, oh boy, I know I'm going to say this wrong, so please forgive me. Vienna, Ohio. Am I correct? Yeah, Vianna. That's how you say it, Vianna. Uh, Vianna. Oh, God damn it. Yeah, Vianna. Uh, no, you did really good. You did very well. Oh, uh, man. You know, these 
from Michigan to Ohio to Indiana, you know, these Midwestern names. Okay. Yeah, we had, we had like, a, it was like East Palestine, but we pronounced it like East Palestine. We had a town, like, named Campbell, and there was, like, a P in the middle, but no one ever said the P. There was a town called Mesopotamia, but we called it Mespo. Hmm. And, uh, yeah, I'm sure you have that in Michigan, too. Oh, yeah, and, uh, yeah, it's a bit of my, uh, own volition, too, due to my, uh, wonderful accent and my, uh, tendency to mispronounce shit. It, it's okay. Yeah, anyway, he's, uh, describing his youth to his white Vita, and, uh, what made you, uh, go this route, you know, t to write your poems within a larger narrative, to make them linked together as a story? As opposed to just say, you know, a common theme or a topic. Well, um, well, I got the idea from Vanity of Delu by Jack Kerouac because Vanity of Delu is like him sitting, you know, in the living room talking to his wife about his childhood, and he's like an older person, and he talks about how Melville did the same thing. And so, um, I don't know if I got that from him, or if I read this book by, or was this, like, Alan Ginsberg, um, Speeches at Naropa. I read that a couple of years ago. Maybe, maybe he said it there. I got, I got, the Phoenix stuff I have all mixed up in my head, because I read so much of it, it's like, all in my head, in all different places. And so, um, that's what Vanity Delu does. He, like, talks about his childhood, and you know, right up to World War II and everything. Um, so I just thought that same method would really work. And then in Bible or Cowboy, it's kind of framed because I give that, like, introduction in the beginning. And mm -hmm. here's a timeline of everything. And, like, okay, here's the timeline preceding the writing of the poetry book. And then what the events, I and mean, then these poems will reflect upon the past events. So I really do believe in... Um, uh, a poetry book that is framed and is, you know, all of it has is related to each other. Like, I don't really, I don't really enjoy poetry books that are not, like, have, they have to have some kind of storytelling narrative um, thing to it. If they're just, like, you know, you know, 82 pages of just random poems. So like, I'm most just a collection. Just put it down. Go ahead. Yeah, just a collection of poems. Just like random poems to try to get yourself tenure or whatever people do nowadays. Oh, okay. Like that, you know, here's 82 poems. I don't know what they mean or what they have to do with each other. I'm just going to, like, tell you. I'm going to hope that I do a poetry reading or get interviewed and, like, notify everyone what it means. But I'm not going to tell you in the book or something. I, I don't like that. Um, I want, it's a book. And a book has a narrative and it has a story. That's what a book is. Oh, okay. And, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Alright. And, uh, in this collection, uh, did your, uh, write... First of all, uh, do you have a writing process when it, uh, comes to poetry? A what to poetry? A writing process. As, comp you know, compared to when you write prose? Is there a difference at all? I don't really know. I mean, like, I usually write the same way as, like, if I start writing something, I'll write in the morning. And then, um, I, then after I'm done in, like, two hours, I'll go and take a break. And then I'll just, like, you know, think about what I'm going to write the next day. So, and then, like, when it, it occurs to me what I'm going to write the next day, I make little notes, you know, like, you know, like little notes. And then I put the notes next to me, you know, on the mm -hmm. desk when I write. All right. Uh, well, was there uh, anything different with this book that you did? Um, yeah, this book I wrote really quickly and it was a lot of fun because it was like I could just, it's during COVID, like at the worst part, you know, it's like the summer and there was just, you know, those riots and everything happened and it's like, 
I really, um, I didn't really think that hard when I wrote it. I just kind of like, um, basically what happened was, um, I live in Las Vegas. I've lived here for like eight or nine. I've been gone from Ohio for like 10 years now. And so I would kind of like tell people stories, my coworkers and my new friends, like my friends, a lot of my friends would be from California here. Or, you know, they would be from different non-Ohio places or like really Southwest people. And I would tell them a story about something that happened in Ohio. And they would be like, that's so crazy. I can't believe that happened. That's a real thing. And I would be like, and I would just kind of jot it down in my mind. Like, oh, that's a thing that is interesting to other people. And I just kind of tried to think of things where like, if I was telling a Southwest person, the imaginary Vita stories, what would I tell her about Ohio if I had like, you know, weeks to tell her things? Like, what would I tell her that would interest her? She's like, you know, she maybe she's from Arizona or from Orange County. And she's just like, has never, ever had to be in Ohio or Michigan, like never took a vacation there in her entire life. What would it, what would make her perk her eyes up as something that was totally weird? And, but also at the same time, I was thinking about what if someone from the Midwest read it? Like, what, so it had to do, it had to have a duality in it. And it had to be written with a sense of duality where it had to appeal to kind of like the sense of nostalgia of a Midwest person mm-hmm. that would like be like, this is interesting. I live something like this. And then would allow them to imagine their own reality of their own moment. Like, oh, I had a moment like this, but it was like this. And then it, it gives them a chance to talk to their friends. Like, oh, I do. Did you read this book? It had this moment. And I'm like, oh my gosh, didn't it, doesn't it remind you of when you and me did this? But at the same time, it had to be written in a way that someone from the Southwest or maybe the Northwest or, you know, could read it and be like, wow, that's so interesting. What a unique moment. Like these people of the Midwest who I never think about, who the media never discusses in any real way, have these like really unique experiences and they have really unique lives. And it just doesn't get discussed in the media because it doesn't, I don't know, it doesn't interest anybody because the, I don't know if it doesn't make money or what, but it doesn't interest people. So it doesn't get made famous, you know, in movies. You see movies in your city, you see movies in LA, you see movies with dragons, but you don't see movies about, like, you know, people just walking around a small town in Ohio or Michigan, Indiana or Illinois. Mm-hmm. And so it had to be like this kind of reality where it was kind of vague enough. It was, it, you had to like be concrete, but at the same time be vague to make both of these groups of people happy. All right. Kind of. Does that make sense? Because oh. I mean, to me, like I'm, I'm always thinking about, I mean, the first thing I always like, who are going to be my audiences? Are they different types of people? Oh, absolutely. What, uh, do, what absolutely. do they need? Uh, yeah, I kind of have a similar process with my own writing. Uh, it's actually, um, uh, God, here's a big throwback. Uh, Johnny Cash, and uh, I believe, God, I think it was his uh, From San Quentin album. He uh, was speaking to the inmates, and uh, I guess he's telling them that... Uh, they were, that beforehand, the uh, staff were trying to tell him, like, you know, what he can or can't do, what he can say or not say. And he just straight up said, I'm here to do what you want me to, what I want to do. And uh, that's kind of how I approach my own writing as well. Like, what do I think people will like? And uh, more so, what do I want to do? That's kind So, yeah, I kind of know what you mean there. Yeah, yeah, you have to, you know, what do I want to do, but how does this fit in into the greater, you know, landscape of people? Yeah, and I do, and yes, I do know, I do do, uh, in the book, I did recognize a lot of the, um, scenarios and, uh, settings, since, uh, I grew up in a little place called, uh, Alpena, Michigan, up in, uh, Northeast Michigan, and, uh, I would say it's, 
I haven't like looked up statistics or anything, but uh, I think it is larger than Vienna, but uh, not by much. But I did recognize like a lot of the people in there, a lot of the scenarios, the rural environment. Yeah, it's just all there, just wah, Midwest, pretty much. <laughs> And, uh, I will say, too, that I have had, uh, people gawk at, uh, stories I told them. Like, let's say I've, like, back in 2019, I went to, uh, London. My, uh, first ever overseas trip. And, uh, since, since the pandemic has happened, possibly my, possibly my last one. You never know. And, uh, I would talk to some people, like, I... have met at a bar or at the place I was staying, and, uh, yeah, they would kind of bug out whenever I would tell them, like, you know, what Michigan was like, or how I grew up, or anything like that, so that was always fun. Well, why would they be bummed out? No, no, bugged out, like, like they uh, can't, like they can't believe what I'm saying. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, not bummed out. <laughs> I mean, if I got oh. deep, if I got deeper, they might get bummed out. But I was just telling yeah. them some of the more funny stuff. Oh yeah, it's a funny place growing up in the Midwest. It's a yeah, strange place. Ah <sighs> yeah. All right. Uh, now, um, Tom's stories, uh, as we've just established, take place in uh, Vienna, Ohio, which uh, to me is a switch up from your previous works. You know, your prose works, like The Insurgent, for example. Because uh, a lot of them take place around Youngstown, Ohio. Uh, can you uh, describe what uh, Vienna is like and how it's different from Youngstown? <laughs> so Vienna is, you know, it's like 25 minutes away, probably by car. It's not very, it's not very far by car. Um, but my parents never took me there as a child. They never took me there. And so, um, I completely, you know, had no idea this whole world existed. So, Vienna, through the eyes of a child, is like you, there is one red light. Um, there is one convenience store. It was called Dairy Mart. And before that, it was called Lawson's. And then now it's called Cir Circle K. Mm -hmm. There's a gas station. There was a supermarket with like deer heads and bear heads and I don't know, like warthog heads. Warthog. Warthog. I have a, some, is that what they're called? I don't know, but um, uh, I think so. In Texas. Oh yeah, they got a shit ton of those down there. And then um, those were on the wall. Uh, there were like between the houses, there was this tree like trees and trees and now there might be like a little bit of trees and there might be like 10 acres of trees and then there was we had the schools and the schools were like always like down a side road that were like surrounded by the trees and we know my class had 90 kids and we were a really good class that usually had like 70 and it took two towns for us to have a school the other town had no red light it just had a caution light very and nice one, one single caution light they had like a general store no gas station no anything they had nothing and um the, the middle school was from 1890 and um <laughs> and uh they it was like the kind of place where everyone knows each other like you walk into anywhere and you were like oh how's it going how's it going how's it going it was like you couldn't escape people it was like you're every it was like everyone was famous it was like the country song about being a small town famous and why you should live in a small town for your whole life and so it was kind of very much like everyone knew each other i remember going to like va breakfasts you know va dinners with my dad and my neighbor my neighbor was like a world war ii veteran um we had well water the water smelled like sulfur and friday 
Um, so you had that. We had mm. chickens, you know. We had five acres of land. And the five acres of land is, is like $100,000. Like five, or 50, or 40. And now it's, you know, it's not an expensive piece of land because no one wants to live there. Because there's like <laughs> no jobs that could really pay for that piece of land. There's no jobs, there's just no jobs there. And so, um, uh, it's five acres, you know, if that was in Las Vegas, like fucking a quarter acre is $300,000, but there it's nothing. And so you would, the backyard had chickens and we had roosters and we had rabbits and we had a giant garden. And then we would, we had like this area set up so you could shoot shotguns and people would come over and we would shoot shotguns and, you know, in the backyard and shoot skeet. And then you could, the, the house, backyard was connected to like i don't know 10 or 20 acres of forest and you could just walk through these like little forests you know when you're a little kid and be in your own world so you kind of live in this little world and there was no there was no hipsters or intellectual activity occurring at all um there was nobody there was like this one principal we had his name was mr demarco who was like our town intellectual who like read books and would talk about books and like if we wanted to read a book he would help us find one. So he was like this kind of um Sherwood Anderson character. Ooh, who, like, really? What? Oh, really? Kind of yeah. He was like this um Italian guy who also did weightlifting, but um he read constantly. He had read everything and. Um, he had rules like you need to read one fiction and then one nonfiction, and that's how you should read books or something. And um, he was like that kind of character for the whole entire town. But there wasn't any other characters like that. There wasn't any people reading books in their house or anything. I mean, there were probably some, but it was kind of like people just lived. You know, it was very rural. And, um, you know, I didn't even really understand what rural meant until I had gone to South America, you know, in Korea, and I witnessed the rural people that live, you know, in those, in Chile and in Peru, I witnessed those people. And I, and I was like, seeing my kind of a uh, white man's American gaze upon them. <laughs> and, I, and I was, you know, and I was like, you know, I, I'm not going to write about those people, but what if I took that gaze that I had of them and just applied it to my own people? Like that kind of like super third person, what the hell are you doing? What's happening? Why are you wearing that? But also at the same time, super compassionate, super forgiving for all the weird stuff they're doing and believing in. Well, you could also say you uh, Ohio Ohioized them. Oh, uh, God, that, that joke sucked. I'm sorry. Wait, what? Oh, uh, God, I made an awful joke. Let's let's not go on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, uh, sure. so you, uh, well, I get, well, that brings up the question, uh, when was the first time you went to Youngstown? I don't remember. I remember the first time I went to Youngstown, it was because we were looking, I was with my friends, and I think we were looking for, like, weird hats, like berets or something, and we didn't, uh, so we drove into Youngstown because there was this, um, somebody had the idea that they would have them at the Black People Church Clothes Store. And there is one in the center in downtown Youngstown. And so we, like, drove in. We're like, oh, my God, we're in Youngstown. And we're, like, 16, 17 years old because we wanted to, like... And we went downtown and we parked. And um, we went into this store and we, like, found a beret or something. But, I, I mean, like, I don't remember my parents ever driving here. They would drive me to Warren, Ohio, because um, that's where my father worked. And so I saw that a lot, but... Like Youngstown specifically, I don't. My dad didn't know anyone there, so mm -hmm. he never drove there. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, the book is a uh, late is labeled as autobiographical. Uh, just how autobiographical is uh, Wild Kingdom? Um, 
I would say, you know, I didn't make anything up. I don't remember. And if I did, it was, if, if, if there's an inaccuracy, it's only because of memory. So, I mean, the autobiography corresponds with my memory of events. All right, and uh, the pictures in the book are you, correct? Yeah, that is. They are me. Like, I think there was a... Like, how many photos were in the book? I remember about two of them right now. There's one when I'm really little, um, framed by a tree, and then there's one with my grandpa when I'm really little. Oh, okay, yeah, I thought that was your uh, father there for a sec. Oh, no, that was my grandfather. Oh, okay. My father looks like Super Mario. (laughs) All right. Uh, I'm glad we got that established. Yeah, so if you're like, oh, there's Super Mario, that's my his dad. His dad. He also looks like Saddam Hussein. Uh, And uh, when Saddam Hussein got really famous, he shaved his mustache. Oh, God, um... Back when I was in a junior high, I had an English teacher that looked, well, like your dad. We went back and forth between Mario and Saddam. And, uh... And, and who? Mario and who? Saddam. Like, you could... He looked exactly like both of them. And, uh... <laughs> and this guy was a dickhead. He was, like, one of the worst teachers I have ever had... You know, he's very aggressive, and, uh, we, it was actually, like, like I said, I was in junior high, and, uh, like, a lot of kids, you know, taught to respect authority and all that shit. He was, like, one of the first teachers, like, I openly defied, because he was that awful. (laughs) And, uh, well, to get a little dark here, he, uh, passed away over, well over a decade ago. Uh, he was one of the first people that I was legitimately glad died. <laughs> like, oh, wow. Yeah, Mario. I know. Yeah, rest in peace, Mario. Oh, Super Mario. Yeah, yeah, this guy sucked. <laughs> I was, I'm glad he's gone. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. <laughs> okay. Oh, by the way, uh, speaking of Super Mario, uh, did you by chance, uh, catch Elon Musk's uh, performance on SNL last weekend? I saw him, uh, I watched one scene, the Chad one. I watched the Chad, because I love the Chad scenes. Oh, I don't yeah. know. That's not going to sell me any books telling people that, dude. <laughs> well, no, no one, well, it's not going to help me either when I admit that I have a death, w- a death list of people that I'm glad are dead. But, uh, no, he, he had a really cringe, uh, a really ki- cringe sketch that had, uh, Musk as Wario, and, uh, he was in court for killing Super Mario. It's very... Oh, I didn't see that. It's very bad, and, uh, I guess, like, he lost over, like, two million in Dogecoin after it aired. <laughs> oh, man, it's... You should look up on YouTube. You'll like it. I watched the one where Chad goes to Mars. Oh, yeah, that one. It, that was actually kind of an okay one. I really love... Uh, what is his name? Davidson? I don't know his first name. Uh, I honestly don't know. I, uh, I only watch SNL whenever I uh, visit my folks, like, once a month. Since uh, there's nothing really to do in Alpina, especially during this pandemic. Anyway, <laughs> all right. Uh, Wild Kingdom has uh, been out for, I say, about a month now, right? I think so. I think it has been a month. Yeah. How has the reception been for it? Um, people keep they when I wanted to give books away, people were like, I got like so many in a matter of like minutes, it was weird. And people have been emailing me and tell me it's really nice. And I've done another podcast with someone else from Michigan last week. And I did some interviews, so everything seems to be okay. I think that's what's supposed to happen. Well, uh, 
Wait, you said that you uh, did our podcast with our Michigander? Yeah, his name is Joe Balecki, and he lives in Grand Rapids. So I have a huge fan base in Michigan, so I should probably do a Michigan tour. Uh, oh, Elizabeth Allen interviewed me, and she lives in Michigan, too, I think. So oh, yes. I've only really got impressed from people from Michigan and, like, one other person. Oh, yes. Uh, one thing is very clear. Michiganders cannot get enough of Noah Cicero. People from Michigan read a lot. They... Yeah, and uh, yeah. Jokes aside, I did uh, read that interview with uh, Elizabeth Ellen. Uh, great interview, and uh, yeah, shout out to Ellen. Great writer, great person. Uh, she was nice enough to uh, blurb one of my past books. So, uh, so yeah, she's awesome. Probably the best uh, modern Michigan writer. In my opinion. Elizabeth Allen. I think Sam Pink lives there now, too. You have, like, everyone there. I don't know what's going Oh, shit. He was, like, five, year, five years ago, he, like, lived there or something. Really? Sam Pink lives here now? I thought he was in Florida. Oh, man. I don't know. I haven't spoken to him in three years. But I think, like, three years ago, he, like, came back from Florida and, like, lived in Michigan, like, in secret or something. Huh. Yeah, uh, do you follow Sam on Twitter? No, my Twitter, like, I turned it off one day, and I can't get it to back, it's like, they said it was gone. Oh, ouch. But, well, I do, and, uh, well, he just tweeted recently that, uh, I think, like, four of his, uh, books are, he took them out of print. Uh, I think it was, like, Ron Tell, Her Others, The No Hellos Diet, and, uh, one other. So that kind of shocked me, actually, when I saw that. But the book is out of print? Yeah, he, like, just took them out of print. And uh, I don't think he's given an explanation why. Maybe someone else will publish them. I know my one book, Best Behavior, is out of print. Hmm. Well, I'm glad to say that I have all those books on Nook, so, uh, so at least I can still reread them. I have, like, uh, so many of him. I have like all of his and Scott McCannahan's um, going back and like, you know, other people's. I have like just massive amounts of those indie press books on a shelf, but we have like the Sam Pink and the Scott McCannahan books like on a special shelf like in my sister's house so like no one so then you can like untouched as the originals. <laughs> yeah. And, like, keep them like, like, like their treasure. Yeah, as, as they should. They're both great writers and uh, great dudes. Yeah, I haven't seen them in years. Which, uh, last time I saw one, I think I saw Scott McCannahan in like 2013 or 2014. And I, I, uh, I haven't seen Sam Pink in 10 or 11 years. <clears throat> uh, I actually saw Scott and Sam at the same time. Uh, I think around... Yeah, like you just mentioned, 2013 or so, when, uh, at reading in Chicago, uh, Scott, Scott was nice, you know, great, great dude to talk to, and, uh, Sam, I actually had a long conversation with him, because, uh, he just got done with his set, uh, you know, we talked about Chicago and about writing, and, uh, I think I, like, accidentally, well, or at least he thought like I was uh, flirting with him, because uh, cause this was when I like was first getting into him. I was reading uh, Hurt Others, his uh, short story collection, and a lot of it talked about you know working in a warehouse, and I'm all like, "Hey man, I worked in a warehouse too. You still uh, work there?" He said he didn't. I'm like, "Oh, I oh I could have been mistaken. You know, you look like you work in a warehouse." And, uh, kind of got a little bit awkward there for a sec. Then I realized what I said. He's huge. He's a huge dude. He's oh. so big. Oh, yeah, he's very swole. Yeah, he's totally big. He's got these huge legs. It's really, like, really good. He could have been, like, a boxer or something. Very right? yeah. good specimen. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So, yeah, Sam, Sam, if you're listening, uh, you're awesome, and... No, I was not hitting on you back then. 
<laughs> All right. Sam, uh, Sam, I'm always hitting on you. So don't worry. Oh, good to know. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> oh, That's funny. All right. Oh, well. All right, then. Uh, all right, Wild Kingdom has uh, been out for a month. You've been uh, getting a lot of praise and a lot of love from us Michiganders, as you should. Uh, uh, do you... Uh, you have any plans to write a poetry book like like this again in this narrative style? Oh, I don't know. I don't have any poetry. I don't have any books in my head planned, you know, like at all. So, I mean, I'm assuming I'm like it'll get yeah, I mean, like it would be fun to do it like that again. I, you know, I don't even think about it as poetry. It's just like a way of. I didn't want to like make scenes where I had to, like, construct, you know, open the scene, tell you what time it is, tell you the who, what, where, when, why. I didn't want to do it. I just didn't feel like it. So it just came better like that. And then for some reason, people think it's okay when I do that. But, I mean, Mm -hmm. to me, in my head, there's just, like, kind of funny ways, like, you're talking to someone, and this is how it comes out. All right. Uh, okay, uh, the very last question uh, I would like to ask you on this topic. It's, uh, this is uh, something that I noticed near the end of the book that has uh, really stuck out to me. Uh, at the end there, uh, Tom details a conflict he was having with a local bully. And, uh, and I wrote this down because I wanted to get it exactly. He uh, says that, at that moment, life offered me two possible options. One, to rebel, to rebel, and two, to become cynical and dark as them. Uh, as the author of this work, uh, which one do you think that uh, he turned out to be by, by the end of the book? You know, by the time that he's uh, talking to uh, his wife about all this. He becomes, you know, the the rebel person, and he makes that choice to turn the other cheek in those situations. Um, so, rebellion is many things. It's not just yelling. It's not just screaming or fighting back. You know, sometimes it's just like you. Or you can rebel when someone is mean to you by not being mean again. You know, like I'm not gonna, you're not gonna make me mean. You're not gonna do it. You're not gonna win. You're not gonna make me like you. And to me, that is like a, a, a real form of rebellion is when someone is trying to make you mean and trying to make you cruel and trying to destroy you. And you say, I'm not gonna do that. But you don't fight back their way you fight by turning the other cheek and saying listen you want to hit me go ahead and hit me again you can do it you can hit me as much as you want you can hit me 77 times and i'll forgive you 77 times and it's problematic when you think like that because you often lose in life but also your rebellion might be losing and knowing that you're actually winning and you need to surround yourself with people that actually know what a win and a loss really is. Oh, okay. All right, I get it now. All right, uh, that, that that was something I was kind of questioning at the end there. But, all right, uh, thanks for verifying then. Yeah, he, he, there's, yeah you're, you're right. There's no way. We don't know what his life goes on to be. You know, we don't know what he actually is in life. We don't know what job he has. We don't know how he treats Vita. We don't know if he kisses Vita every morning and looks in her eyes and is like, I love you, Vita, so much, or if he, like, gets drunk and hits her. That's never said in the book. You know, I didn't even realize that. <laughs> never even really occurred to me that you said it. That's amazing. Yeah, but, yeah, you don't know who he is, actually. Yeah, just a small part of his life that he's now describing. Yeah, but that gives the audience a chance to make it theirs. It kind of gives them ownership over whatever's said because they don't know who he is. So that vagueness, 
allows the audience to um, participate. All right. Okay, uh, let's move on to a non, non-literary non topic. Though it can be literary since, uh, you know, you're a writer and you're all about that life. Uh, let's talk about Las Vegas for a sec. Okay. Yeah, well, first of all, uh, well, before we get into Las Vegas proper, you uh, noted that you uh, wrote Wild Kingdom, like, in the myth. During like the worst part of COVID in Nevada. Yeah, that's when I wrote it in the in the summer, when every, when like things were like very you know people were shut down and people weren't doing anything. Well, uh, well, in previous, well, since the pandemic started, uh, there's been a favorite question that I've asked uh, guests, and I'll uh, ask you now. Uh, where, where uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, cough there. Okay, my uh, favorite question I'd like to ask you is, uh, where were, where were, where uh, were you when, uh, when COVID first started? Like, uh, was there like an oh shit moment you had when you realized that this was going to be a big thing? Um, I remember I was at work and people were talking about it happening in Asia and people were talking about it and then I remember like um, I went my boss called me into the office and is like we're laying you off you've only worked here eight months and you get paid the second most so um, you're leaving and we're only going to keep the two oldest employees and try to survive you know through the thing because we, I worked in the court system in, the, in a personal injury law firm, and the courts all shut down. All these things shut down. It was just like, boop, shut down. Mm-hmm. And he was like, um, he sent everybody, he sent mostly everybody home on a day, you know? And uh, I was like, okay, okay. And then, um, then I didn't really think about it too much. And then, um, I even made a joke, you know, like, oh, man, it's a zombie apocalypse. I remember making that joke and, like, not giving a shit around, like, you know, March 20th <laughs> or something. Like, I didn't think, I didn't, it didn't occur to me. And then, um, I think in April, I was like, oh, this is a very real thing. And it was kind of like, yeah, I had, like, imaginations, like, oh, it's going to come here, it's going, this is going to happen. I didn't know it was like it would just kind of slowly creep from city to city. And I just kept, you know, checking the death toll and being super paranoid. And um, then I was like, oh, no, it just like slowly creeps around each city. And when it gets to my city, you know, well, you know, and I didn't throw any parties. I didn't go out. Um, and, you know, it's a room full of people. I always wore my mask. I always washed my hands. I just did exactly everything they told me to do. And we, you know, that's what we did. And I saved, a, you know, I saved a lot of money because I wasn't doing anything. So it wasn't that bad. And um, I, I, you know, washed my fucking hands and wore the fucking mask and uh, kept my fucking mouth shut. <laughs> what I was told. All right. Uh, yeah, what's Las Vegas like right now? Oh, like everything's open. There's people everywhere. Yeah. And, uh, you know, freaking cars are everywhere and smog hell. And yeah, are you vaccinated? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm vaccinated. Because I was part of the legal community during... And the legal community got theirs just as soon as nurses. <laughs> yeah, uh... Funny. Yeah, Tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, I think it was like, God, I forget what time last year, but uh, was it Nevada's governor or Las Vegas mayor that like appeared drunk, appeared seemingly drunk on TV and was telling people to come to come to Las Vegas and kind of like act like some kind of weird petri dish for COVID. Yeah, that's mayor. Uh... Mayor Goodman, she and her husband have been the mayor here for decades. 
Jeez. Uh, they have lived here. They just like they got famous because they were the lawyers for mobsters in the nineteen seventy. And she, the Goodman family, kind of just I don't know. They like have just been there, but uh, I, I don't know. Like I don't even know anything about. Like I watched the video and like she did that, but like no one takes her seriously or anything. Well, to to us here in Michigan, it was a. Uh... One of those big what the fuck moments. Oh. Which uh which is kinda similar to when uh earlier this year when uh that one mayor in Texas sent out that uh letter to residents who were complaining after their power got knocked out during that storm. You know, only the only the only the fit will survive and all that bullshit. Oh yeah, I think I remember that. Yeah, I man, I just love it when politicians kind of do that stuff. It's darkly hilarious. Even even if it is uh, very sad and frightening. Yeah, I don't understand the Mayor Goodman situation where she thought we were going to be a fucking petri dish. No one was going to do that. She's not even going to control. It's like the corporations are in control. And, like, uh, I mean, Las Vegas is, like, well, they have all those corporations, and then they have, like, Chinatown, and then they have the Mormons, um, and so... Wait, I mean, like, wait no the one, Mormons are in Las Vegas? What? The Mormons are in Las Vegas? Oh, my gosh, dude. That's, like, half the white people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I did not know that. I I seriously did not know that about Las Vegas. Oh, Las Vegas, um, much of it was put together by the Mormons. The Mafia would use Mormon money. Um, there are Mormon LDS churches, temples or whatever they're called, all over the place. Um, I've worked primarily for Mormons in the legal world. There are many of the higher ups in the city, um, and they they are very important here. Like they're very important. Like they're, it's very important. Like we have a lot of Mormons and a lot of um, Chinese and Koreans, and then we have the casinos who are like the most important. Do any of the know, Mor- like, do any of the Mormons uh, run the casinos? The, the what? Do the any Mormons run the casinos? I don't know. I don't know if anyone knows who owns the casinos. <laughs> the Mormon Mafia. The Mormon uh, Mafia owns Las Vegas Paving. Awesome. And Las Vegas Paving is the biggest. Uh, they make all the bridge. They make all the you know all the things for the roads. They do all the sewage. They do all this stuff, you know. And so the huge companies that do the construction work are all Mormon. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, wow, I learned something today. Thank you, Noah Cicero. And uh, many of the law firms are Mormon. Many, many, and, um, you know, man, they're, they're everywhere, and, uh, they're, they're everywhere. So I have become friends with many Mormons over the years, learning about them. Uh, have you considered becoming Mormon? No, no, I've never considered it. Even if it would like help help you uh, get up in your career or anything. I don't know. I think you have to be born into it. I don't know. I don't know. You have to have a certain kind of mindset. You have to. They have. A, they're very busy, and they like to go to work a lot, and they like to have like four children. <laughs> and those are all things I don't like to do. I don't like to have four children, and I don't like to go to work a lot. So. I don't know, uh, I got all my Mormon information from, uh, the Book of Mormon musical, and, uh, Fine. looks pretty fun, if you go by that. i never seen it, i never seen it. Uh, okay, joking aside, it's an excellent musical, man. Trey Parker and Matt Stone <laughs> of South Park. It's awesome. I highly suggest it. Oh, okay, thank you. Alright, uh, let's get into Las Vegas proper here. Okay, because uh, when I first started uh, becoming familiar with you and your work, 
You know, I knew about, uh, you know, Youngstown in Ohio. You also wrote about, you know, traveling around the U.S. or going overseas to, like, South Korea. But, uh, what, uh, through all your travels, what ultimately made you decide to settle in Las Vegas? Uh, you there, man? Uh, kind of having a hard time hearing you. Yeah, you're kind of uh, coming in low there. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yep, perfectly. Okay, so uh, someone like my sister, we were all living together, and the father died. And uh, we were like, we don't want to live in Ohio anymore. And uh, I came back from South Korea, and she was like, we're moving. We're moving to Las Vegas. And I said, okay. All right, and, and, uh, then, <laughs> and wow, uh, um, just okay. Yeah, and then I, she was like, well, you can't get a job because we're not moving there until August. And so I said, well, I don't know what to do because it's only, it's only, uh, what the fuck month was it? April. And then she goes, go to the, live at the Grand Canyon. So I just went to the Grand Canyon and lived and worked as a cashier. And then I moved to Las Vegas, and it's perfect for me because I always wanted to live out west, and I always wanted to be close to national parks, and this is the perfect location for that. All right, and, uh, well, this is just, uh, from my interpretation of your your writings, but, uh, one thing that I've kind of always fascinated me about you living in Vegas is, you know, a lot of the glam and materialism that Vegas is often portrayed as having. Uh, has this uh, affected you in any particular way, or has it clashed with any of, you know, your beliefs or, you know, whether it's philosophical or political? The materialism? What, what do you mean? Oh, cause, uh, uh, sorry. It's kind of a badly worded question, I guess. I guess, uh, Honestly, you know how glamorous and wild Las Vegas is often portrayed as being? It kind of, I guess, kind of like uh, reading your books and, uh, you know, you know, know, knowing you for a while. Kind of, see, it kind of fascinates me that so, someone uh, like you would be attracted to something like Las Vegas as opposed to something uh, more low key or quote-unquote real, if you want to use that term? Um, many people I know are very spiritual here, and um, I go hiking every Sunday, and the mountains and the desert are full of people, you know, and I, um, many people, I go Many people here are very spiritual. I mean, you have the Mormons and, and the Catholics and these weird Baptist people, and you have many Buddhist kind of centers. Um, you have many yoga places. You have many uh, things like that. So I have not driven to the, the strip, you know, the part with all the casinos, to the strip part. That's what they, we call it. I don't know what they call it in, in Michigan. Well, that, but the part yeah, that... with all the casinos. Yeah. I have not set foot in, in, in over a year or two. Uh, yeah, because that's... Yeah, I've never been to Las Vegas, but uh, every media portrayal that I've seen is, well, the Strip. Yeah, if, if you came to my house and hung out for a night or two,
all these things can be accessed within two hours. And if you drive another hour, you can get the more things. If you drive another hour, you can get the more things. So um, you can live in your own special life easily in Las Vegas with, 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 and, and live your own little spiritual, philosophical, weird life. And, and <laughs> you, you, the strip is, you know, it's 25 minutes away and it's kind of like Disneyland probably for people of Los Angeles. Like they know it's there and they know that I know if like a really cool concert's coming, I can drive there and go, which I've done, you know, on many occasions. And so that can happen. And like, you know, it's there and you know, things can happen. And if you, you live in a place where at least things can happen. And you can go, I think the last time I went was like Circus Soleil right before the pandemic. I went to Circus Soleil. It was very nice. Oh, awesome. Um, my friend gave me a free ticket. And so um, things like that can happen. You're like, you know, if you want to see Circus Soleil, you can get in your car and drive down there. And, uh, but, that kind of materialism, you know, I don't even, uh, I don't, it's almost when you're kind of standing there, it's just like, what is more important to me is how confusing everything is. You can't get an Uber there. This is, okay, I'm going to give you what a real Las Vegas person talks like. I can't get a fucking Uber down there, man. The Uber won't fucking go there. And I went into the Venetian and I got lost and I ended up in the fucking Bellagio and I don't know where the buffet is. And then I lost my cousin. My cousin came here from freaking Texas, and I'm trying to walk him around. I'm like, I'm now that I got a kind of text message. I don't know where they are. And then I get out of my car, and someone got in the wreck on the, on the strip, and I can't drive back to where my house is, so I had to sit down there for an hour. <laughs> oh my God. So, like, that is the actual. I mean, everybody in every city in the entire planet has conversations like that, where, like, these are the actual conversations. From the people from my neighborhood when we start talking about this stuff. Okay. How you, how you can't get an Uber, how this happens, and how this happens, and it's so hard to drive, and it's like gives me a panic attack, and why did they raise prices on the parking deck? And people don't know that we're locals and we don't want to pay them $15. <laughs> All right. Okay, so yeah. it, it's, not, it's not like it's portrayed in. Uh... Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas by the late, great Hunter S. Thompson, right? Oh my god, no. I mean, no. I mean, the first thing that will stop you from having a good time is the fact that you want bottled water and car paid dollars. Oh, okay. And unless you have, like, you are ready to spend $2,000, like, $1,000 a day, you will not have the Hunter S. Thompson experience. Like, you have to be ready for $800 a day, lowest amount to have a good time down there. And um, otherwise, your money will be just eaten by the, the if you, $300 would last you an hour and a half. <laughs> you couldn't even gamble with that. To go to a concert, just decently, is like six $700. So, you know? so even all the drugs in the world won't matter if you don't have the money. Yeah, you couldn't, you, you have to have money yet to really enjoy yourself. It's not an enjoyable experience unless you have money, because you're basically staring at things you don't have the whole entire time. You can't even purchase. A pack of cigarettes is like 16 bucks or something. A, a beer is like $15. Uh, uh, something with scotch in it or something, 20 something. Yeah. Like, it's just astronomical. This is what people talk about. Like, when like my neighbors were all standing outside and you were, like, standing, like, four back, like, smoking a cigarette and just, like, listening to what, like, my neighbors would be talking about. That's, this is what our conversation would be like. All right. Well, uh, actually, uh, the whole thing, thing about, you know, if I came to your house, that could actually be arranged since, uh, Las Vegas is on the list of uh, places I plan on visiting soon since uh, I've been vaccinated and I uh, feel a lot more confident to travel now. So Yeah, you should come and we could go um, to, yeah. to, to, to things. Nice. Yeah, man, we'll uh, definitely hang out when I get there eventually. But uh, and I do want to talk to you about uh, nature a little since uh, 
obviously nature is a huge part of your work. I mean, your latest one is obviously nature is a huge theme of it. And uh, I wanted to know, uh, how uh, would you dif differentiate... Uh, God, I can't say that word. Uh, what... Uh -huh. Yeah, how, yeah, what, how, how will you differentiate the nature in Nevada compared to, uh, Ohio? Oh, wait, hold on, I'm thinking. Uh, take your time. In Ohio, in Ohio, the nature is, like, there's always, like, dirt bikes, um, and four-wheelers and snowmobile kind of nature. Where there, you know, there's trails, but the trails are full of like ruts, and um, everything is really wet and damp in Ohio, and your shoes are always muddy, and um, your pant legs are always muddy, and 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 you have that, but you can have a really great time walking around the woods in Ohio, and no doubt you can you could spend hours having a wonderful time in Michigan or Ohio or Indiana, just having a blast. In Las Vegas, um, you know, in Ohio, though, it's very in, in the woods, it's very easy to get lost, and it's so much easier um, to to lose one's way in those trees. It's so weird. In, in in Nevada, you have these like in Nevada, Arizona, and Utah, you have clearly marked trails with no motorcycles, dirt bikes, or any spray paint or anything, mm -hmm. and uh, there's there's no real sign. <laughs> of people and if someone does spray paint something they like everyone will t actively try to fix it pretty immediately and um so the trails are you know they're only like about four or five feet wide and they're very rocky and there's no at most you'll see a mountain bike but there's no dirt bikes motorcycles four-wheelers snowmobiles allowed or anything well there's a desert out there too right there's what it's a desert out there isn't it yeah, so the desert is very, uh, and when you hike and go into nature, you stay on the trail basically because you're surrounded by rocks and you're always in a canyon or you're going up the side of a hill. So there's, it's very impossible to get lost. And you're kind of just on the trail and that's your life. But in, but in the woods, you can just walk off the trail. And if you kind of know where you're going, you can walk off the trail. But I would never walk off the trail in the desert or in those types of places. Yeah, that kind of sounds like a bad idea. <laughs> yeah, so it's a different it's a different experience where you're very much like, I'm going to stay on the trail, but in Ohio, you can just walk off, you know, and if you don't mind getting cut by those bushes, jagger bushes or something, you know, with the little pokey things. Uh, pr then, pricker, bu pricker bushes, thorn bushes. Yeah. Yeah, if you don't mind that, you can have a, you can walk off the trail. All right. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, <clears> Hi. <throat> uh, yeah, like I uh, said to you before we start recording, I'm uh, dealing with like pre-summer allergies. So, as you can tell, it only uh, increases my interview skills. <laughs> very, pro very professional. Hmm. Have you been to the desert? No, I have not, actually. Oh, my God. Do you want to go? Yeah. Fuck yeah. <laughs> yeah, you should go. I mean, the best place is to get to the desert, like Las Vegas or Los Angeles or Phoenix. Those are great places that you can get out of an airplane and go see the desert. Oh, nice. Yeah, in uh, actuality, when I've reflected on my travels... Most of it has just been around the Midwest, and uh, especially to Chicago, you know, where I would like to move to eventually. The farthest, the farthest I've ever traveled in the U.S. was uh, down to Florida when I was a kid. My family and I went to Disney World, and uh, the, farther, the farthest I ever traveled by myself so far is uh, London, England. So, uh, compared to you, so yeah, compared to you, I have a lot of catching up to do. Yeah, you should just go to the desert. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, uh, yeah. Alright. 
All right. And, it, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would. Yeah, I would love to come to the desert, man. And yeah, man, that's maybe when I eventually do come to Las Vegas, that's something you and I can do. Just yeah, man, go out fun. to the desert, two Midwesterners, all by ourselves. There's a lot of Midwestern people here. There's like the Michigan Bar and Ohio Bar, you know, themed places. There's a Chicago, right down the street from my house, there's a Chicago place, and you go in and you sit at the counter and they give you this like uh, sausage thing and this hot dog and. <laughs> I'm sure it's like Chicago Tonys, and then across the street from that is a place called Detroit Nathan's. Uh. <laughs> and there's an Ohio bar where you go in, and it's like they serve like calzones. Oh come on! And, um, <laughs> and uh, they have Cleveland Browns and Cleveland Indians memorabilia everywhere. <laughs> These are real things. Like imagine a wow. Chinese restaurant, but imagine a Michigan version. Uh, dude, I don't want to imagine that. Holy shit. Dude, yeah, you go into Detroit Nathan's, and it's full of Michigan, like, Michigan memorabilia, and then you go into, I think it's called Chicago Tony's, and you go in there, it's full of, like, you know, pictures of Michael Jordan and stuff. <laughs> All right. And, and what's his name? Dick Buckus? I don't know. Mike Dicka. Mike Dicka. Is like got twenty pictures in this place, and how badass Mike Dick is, and you like look at Mike Dick's face while you're eating a hot dog <laughs> with no ketchup. I'm I'm sure, right? <laughs> I don't remember. I never. Oh, they put like chili on it. That's the one I got. No, day. that's the big thing. That's one big no-no in Chicago. Apparently, do not put ketchup on your hot dog, or I guess they like huh. put a bullet in the back of your head like immediately. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, uh, last nature question then. Uh, in c between Nevada and Ohio, is there a nature that you prefer? Yeah, I don't like uh, clouds. I don't like them blocking the sun, so I have to pick the desert. Ah, uh, okay. Because I've been in Portland, and I've, uh, I've been in the forest, I've, outside Portland, about an hour south in Silverton, and Monitor, uh, in those towns, and uh, you walk around down old logging trails, you can do that, you know, pretty easily, it's pretty accessible, and it's, like, I love it while it's happening, on, but I don't, I can't do it every day, I can't live with the clouds. And the rain. It's fucking like Edgar Allan Poe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. Every day, I, oh, come every on. day I'm in the pit in the pendulum. But, <laughs> oh, come on. He's so famous now. I'm sure yeah. it'd be worth it. <laughs> Can you repeat that, please? I said, oh, but he's a, he's a legendary writer now. I'm sure it'll be worth it. No, that's not worth it. I need the sun. Uh, I like the sun, but uh, by by make sure to put on a lot of sunscreen since I burn really easy. And uh, oh no! Yeah, it stinks. Like like la like last summer. Well, honestly, I didn't travel anywhere epic. Well, my big <laughs> you're gonna love this. My uh. Big trip for uh, summer 2020. You know where I went? Cleveland, Ohio. Oh, that's really good. My yeah, I mainly went there to go to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But yeah, that was my big summer trip to someplace I've never been to, Cleveland, Ohio. But other than that, cool. I mean, I had fun, but I think I'll go back there when things are you know, quote-unquote, back to normal. You know, because besides the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, there really wasn't much open. But, uh, but yeah, I'm one of those type of guys where, uh, unfortunately, if I'm, like, if I get burned by the sun, it's really bad, and, uh, I could just be out for, like, nearly a week. 
you know, just in, <laughs> in just in pain and exhausted. What? You can't put like creams on your face and stuff. Yeah, I do actually. I put on a lot. It doesn't work. Yeah, it does a little bit, but you know, goddamn, it's bad. Oh, I'm very lucky because my dad is Super Mario, and so my skin doesn't burn. Well, I'm mo well, I'm most. Oh yeah, oh yeah, you're Italian, right? Yeah, Sicilian. My twenty three of me says I'm Turkish, too, and Greek. So I'm super prepared for the sun. Well, well, my friend, I am mostly Irish and German. And from northern Michigan, um, so it's not going to work out well. I'm so sorry about that. <sighs> it's okay. Uh, I, I've learned to adapt. Let's put it yeah, that way. We have, um, so the, the Mexican construction workers, the landscapers, mm -hmm. wear these giant... So Las Vegas is really diverse. It's one of the most diverse cities. United States and probably like in the entire world in terms of like races and ethnic groups and like Asian people sell these like straw hats for cheap and they're like I don't know what they're like Korean they look Korean or Chinese they're like these farmer hats oh and like is, is are those like the hats like I don't know they portray Vietnamese farmers wearing or like wandering samurai wearing that they then epically throw off yeah like these straw hats they're like huge like just like they're like foot and a half wide yeah i know like, you're i know what you're talking about yeah and like all the construct like they sell them for cheap i'm trying to in china <laughs> construction workers are wearing them <laughs> <laughs> very nice and like they're huge they're like they go out like a foot and a half on their head and they're like they're wearing the orange they're working their asses off you know in the hot sun but with like this straw hat on it's, it's kind of cool looking to drive by and see them all these kind of manly men with these weird straw hats on their heads in the middle of america no that's cool actually i yeah I, it's one of my favorite things go ahead uh, I can't imagine that it really protects them, though, like a hard hat would. Oh, I don't know if, if that's an issue for them. Uh, I don't know if I would want to wear that, though, because, uh, no, my luck, like, some picture will appear online that I'll, I don't know, get accused of cultural appropriation, <laughs> and I'll lose, like, all five of my fans. <laughs> Funny. Yeah, don't do that. Unless you're gonna do construction or uh, landscaping work in the city of Las Vegas, when it's 100 degrees outside. Yeah, yeah, I'll stick to wearing something safe, like you know, a Native American headdress at Coachella or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's also a good bonus. So really good. You can stop at all the places while right. you're here. All right. All right. Uh, enough about Las Vegas. Uh, I have uh, only one question about Ohio for you. Uh, beforehand, you uh, said that it's been about 10 years now that you've lived in Las Vegas? Yeah, it's like 2021. Uh, no, I lived in Korea, and then I lived in the Grand Canyon, and then I lived here, so I don't know. It has been maybe nine. I don't know. Uh, close close to a nine. decade. And uh, have you uh, been back to Ohio since? I was there four years ago, over four years ago, like four years and like three months ago, I think. Okay. Um, well, since you've been away for like nearly a decade, has your uh, views on Ohio changed since then? Has what changed since then? Your view or outlook of Ohio, has it changed for the better or for worse since then? I, uh, sometimes I really want to see a rhododendron or, uh, someone showed me a picture of dogwood yesterday and I thought, oh, I'd love to see a dogwood. Oh, okay. And, you know, I mean, I don't, I mean, I don't know what I would do there or anything. I don't know. I don't really, 
I don't think I think about it too much. Um, as in, you know, what did it, what do you mean, like, my view? Like, what, what is your, what is the view that I could have? Like, if it's a, being a bad place or a good place or... Yeah, whether familiar. you... Yeah, it's, yeah. Do you do you have a favorable look on it? Do you unfavorable? Just do you like the state of Ohio or yay or nay? Uh, I don't think I'd uh, want to live there again. Um, but uh, you know, but because I have my own personal things that I like, I like I like the desert and I like these specific things about life that over the course of my life I found out that I really liked. But I, I don't think I want to, uh, I don't feel any need to disperse the people of Ohio or anything like that. All right. Uh, and, uh, do you have, do you plan on staying in Vegas still, or, uh, do you have plans to move on eventually? Uh, I don't really know. I don't really know. I, I haven't thought about moving. It's never, it's never, it's not occurred to me to leave. Um, my friend, the people that I came here with, they want to maybe move to Grand Junction, Colorado, and maybe like two, three, four years or something, because um, mm -hmm. we're all in our 40s now, so, you know, maybe, you know, like 10 years in Las Vegas and being a giant city is like pretty good, but maybe moving to a smaller place might be good. Retirement so, community? To what? Retirement community? Well, I mean, we'll only be like 43 or 45, but, <laughs> so, you know, moving to a place, a different place, you know, um, that's all. I think, I mean, when you're 40, we're going to be 45, and, you know, it's like, we don't need to go out for night life or anything, you know? Oh, okay. All right, dude. Uh, last thing, uh, last thing I would, uh, like to ask you here, uh, we're going back to literary stuff, you know? And uh, another thing I've been wondering about uh, about you and your work, and uh, God, I can't remember where I heard this. Whether it was like a post you made on Facebook or uh, or another interview you did, but uh, but I think I recall you talk about uh, your past work. You know, the Human War, you know, the Insurgent, and the like, as like your blue period. Or like you considered it a part of a part of your writing career that's uh, long gone. Uh, do do you have like any particular opinion on your past work, like now, as opposed to like back uh, then? Yeah. So um, I mean, I wrote Human War, which was like a best behavior I wrote there and I wrote a lot of things that I posted on the blog like if you were like in the blog days I posted I, I posted like several whole novels on the on that blog that I had and um, I did a lot of I just wrote and wrote and wrote so like in my mind when I say that I'm seeing like the three or four books that I just like posted on blogs and all the short stories that I got published that in the websites are like gone now. So I'm standing here and I know all of that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And um, you might not know it. Like if you're a person and you're like, I just bought nature documentary and I have read um, Wild Kingdom. If you're like, this is the only two books I've ever seen. You might not have any idea, you know? But I know it. I know it because I, I was there, you know. And um, <laughs> people, and then so when I look at it, it's very much like I was just like such an angry young person, so angry, and so um, I was very sheltered and I was very angry. And so, and then I was caught up with all these types of people um, that were from New York City and Chicago. And I had all of those people, like, in my life, you know, all those writers or young writers. And so I was being, like, influenced by them. And I was being, like, in constant contact with them. But then around when I was in Korea, I could see, I graduated college and gone to Korea, and I was in Korea, and I could see that the 
younger people, the, the people I was hanging out in my 20s were kind of like very selfish. And a lot of the writers I thought were basically like Ayn Rand fans. Ooh. But like they weren't, they weren't openly Ayn Rand fans. They were just Ayn Rand people. And they didn't even know it. Well, did they write as bad as she does? Oh, no, some of them, you know, they write very well. <laughs> okay. That's but what, I, I really got the... Go ahead. Cause that, that's what I find more offensive about Rand than uh, her beliefs or her personality. It's just that uh, I think she's a shitty writer. I don't even remember anything I ever read about her. I remember I read John Galt's speech and thought it was hysterical. Uh, but I don't think I thought it was hysterical <laughs> for the right reason. I thought it was... Yeah, the the, the only the only two Rand books I've read in full was uh, Anthem, which was pretty mediocre. Then uh, her her essay collection called The Virtue of Selfishness, and uh, the only essay I remember that was like the last one where uh, she was coming out against uh, civil rights, with her whole excuse yeah, she- yeah her whole excuse being, well you know I'm not racist. But, yeah, it was shitty. And so, yeah, so I had all these friends and stuff, and I didn't really think they were good friends. And so when I returned from Korea and started living in Las Vegas, I made, like, a transition. And I started getting really into spiritual things, and I wrote Bipolar Cowboy, and I wrote other books. You know, and the Grand Canyon book that I wrote, and Las Vegas Bootlegger, and these other books were all very different, you know, from that previous version of myself. All right. Uh, actually, uh, if you allow me to geek out here for a sec, I can uh, tell you some of my memories of uh, reading your work, if you would like to hear them. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I remember the first time that I read you was... Uh, you had an excerpt from uh, the insurgent on uh, Moo Moo House, uh, Taolin's uh-huh. publishing venture, which yeah. I think is still going on. And uh, y- yeah, if I remember right, the excerpt was uh, the main character just basically sitting in his room and uh, he's watching videos about peak oil and conspiracy theories. Yeah. And. Uh, yeah, that's one thing that attracted me to your work was, uh, yeah, I don't know if you meant it or not, but, uh, it was, this particular excerpt was hilarious. <laughs> Especially, uh, you know, just listing off all this horrible apocalyptic stuff, followed by the, uh, the Illuminati watches down and laughs, laughs hysterically. <laughs> Which, uh, and he does what? And laughs hysterically? Yeah, the Illuminati is watching and laughs hysterically. I think that's what you wrote. Something like that. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, the, yeah, I bought I bought the Insurgent after on uh, Nook. And, uh, yeah, yeah, it really affected me, that book, for, uh, two reasons. One, the pro style just really stood out to me. And uh, I believe that you did like a YouTube video on this, like describing your style. But it's basically like every sentence is like its own thing. Like it's not part of a larger paragraph. Uh, Am I correct? Yeah, that was it. I called it a centigraph. Yeah, and uh, that what really stood out to me. And, uh, it influenced my, uh, very first novel, uh, Animaki, which I sent you a copy of, actually. Oh, I, nice. I don't know if you, uh, liked it or not, but, uh, yeah, yeah, don't tell me here if you didn't like it. My, uh, my ego can't take any more bashings. <laughs> but, uh, seriously, uh, that's what, that's what, uh, the insurgent and your, uh, other works like, you know, The Human War and Burning Babies had on me with that prose style was, uh, 
how it made like every sentence stand out, whether it stood out seriously or or hilariously, like with that excerpt. And uh, and I guess and I guess I wanted to do something like that for my first novel, so uh, I kind of took that style, uh, and I think it worked out for me. I think it's a lot of fun to write like that. It's always still a lot of fun to even read a book like that. It's fun. I know, and it's still my favorite book of yours. Like, I love everything. The, the Insurgent? Yes, it is. Oh, wow. That was like, yeah, oh, wow. Most people don't say that. I know, it's still... Uh, amazing. I know, I still love it. And uh, I actually rewrote it uh, last week after I, re- after I read... Uh, Wild Kingdom there. And yeah, it's, I think I've, God, what's been like nearly 10 years since I've read it? And yeah, it still holds up for me. Oh, wow. Yeah, and uh, I, got, I got some other memories with your work that I think you'll find amusing. Uh, you see, uh, I read all my stuff on the Kindle and Nook apps on my phone. And uh, before. Okay. Before I got an Android phone, I had Nook on my computer, so I read your work and other works off my laptop. Uh, one time I was visiting my folks, and uh, I was reading Burning Babies for the first time. And uh, I was on the couch with my mom, you know, we are both on our laptops, and she just happens to, like, look over when uh, I was at a part where... Uh, I believe one of the characters is like this shell shocked Vietnam vet. And he just starts yeah. he just starts screaming, I've seen babies burning and it just goes on and on like that. So, yeah. so my mom looks over and she's like, What are you reading about burning babies? <laughs> I'm like, No, no, mom, this is a guy having a freak out. That's really funny. That really happened. Yeah, and, and then I explained it, explained the story and who you were. And then I was like, oh, well, that's nice, Gary. And then she just went back to doing what she did. And uh, the final one uh, actually is the, fir- the first and only time that I met Tao Lin. It was uh, at Elizabeth Allen's house. And yeah, that's, Elizabeth who? Oh, Elizabeth Allen, okay. Yeah, Tao Lin, uh, so I meet him, and, you know, and, well, for anyone not listening, uh, Tao, Tao Lin is, a. Uh, I guess, oh, God, I guess you could say he's a regular-sized person, Asian-American, whereas I am, like, a 6'2", like, over 250-pound white man from northern Michigan. So, uh, I'm very excited to meet him. And, you know, I come up and I say, Oh, hey, Tao, big fan of yours. You know, love Taipei and shop living for American apparel. Blah, blah, blah. You know, he's kind of taken aback by this, but we got into a, uh... But kind of like with Sam Pink, we, uh, started talking and had a good time. And, yeah, I told him, like, yeah, man, uh, you've also helped me get into others' work. Like, I got into Noah Cicero since, you know, since, you know, you post his work on his site. And he's like, oh, yeah, Noah, great guy. You know, I love him. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's great. And then, uh... Do you want to hear, do you want to hear a Talon story? Well, uh, yeah, I do. And, well, one last thing on this, um... Oh, go ahead. Well, well, I think I made an impression on him because uh, he and Ellen and a few others were on a book tour at the time. They had, like, their own Twitter. Next day, I'm, I'm like, following the Twitter, and I look on there, and there's a tweet that says, like, Tao can't stop talking about Garrett. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. One of the big highlights of my literary career so far. That's really good. But, uh, but yeah, you have a Talon story? <laughs> um, I went to New York City in, like, 2006, I think. 
maybe six, really young, 2005, 2006. And, uh, we're just outside all day. It's the summer and we're sweating all day. And I don't know why, but I didn't have any socks or something on. And my feet smelled horribly. And um, we go back to his apartment and he... It was like you had, he lived in like a, he was living in like a closet, like a big closet, and he was going to sleep on the bed, and I was going to sleep on the floor, like, and I, there was like a mat or something, it wasn't terrible, but my feet smelled really horribly, so I went to the bathroom, and I washed my feet, and um, still didn't get the sink off, got most of it off, and I came back in the room, and was like, your feet still smell, <laughs> like, I know, and um, he like, took perfume and then rubbed it all over my feet. And I like sit there and like he gets up and he's just, he's 24 years old and I'm like 25 or 26. And he's just like, I'm sitting there and he's just like rubbing really gently like perfume or some kind of lotion, smelly lotion all over my feet while we're chatting. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, no, there's that whole story about Jesus doing the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, uh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, we, we confirmed that on this podcast, Taolin is the savior. Well, no, it was, a, it was a woman. Remember, there was a woman who came and she rubbed Jesus' feet with her hair. Wait, I thought it was our way around. <laughs> oh, God. It was, such a, it was such a silly moment. It was, like, unbelievably silly. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that that's great, dude. Yeah, he's finally coming out with his uh, long-awaited Leave Society novel, too, this year. You know, about time. <laughs> I think so. I don't know. August, I think. <sighs> okay, Noah. Uh, man, that's, that's everything I wanted to talk about with you today. That was really wonderful. Thank you very much. Yeah, dude, uh, well, 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 what can I say, um, uh, you know, all my joking aside and shit talk, yeah, I'm, I was really, really happy to talk with you today, man, uh, like, like I said, uh, earlier, uh, The Insurgent was, a uh, is a huge book for me, one of my all-time favorites, and, uh, I consider you one of my big literary influences, especially, uh, living influences, you could say. And, uh, your work has, has, uh, really touched me personally, both as a writer and as a person. You know, I've really related to it, and I've really been inspired by it. And, uh, yeah, I just really appreciate you as a person as a, and as a writer. So, it was a real honor talking with you today. I liked it. Thank you for saying the nice things. I'm glad. I'm glad you, you it did that for you. I'm glad. All right. Yeah. I, yeah. Like I said, I've been. Uh, I'm starting to travel again, and uh, well, when I when I do eventually make it to Las Vegas, or uh, I'll I'll try to hit you up, and uh, I guess if you ever get the notion to come back to the Midwest, uh, hit me up, man. I would uh, love right. to see, love to meet you. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, Noah, uh, is there anything you would uh, like to promote or advertise? You know, where can people um, purchase Wild Kingdom or any of your other work? You should go and buy Wild Kingdom and Las Vegas Bootlegger. That's what everyone should do immediately after hearing they're done listening to this or you can listen to this and open another browser page and then do it while you're doing listening <laughs> <laughs> you should do this for the benefit of the publisher um, and their self-esteem you don't have to do it really yeah <laughs> both uh both house of Vlad, correct uh no the other one is tried and press oh okay uh, Nate Perkins have you read Nate Perkins uh what's his name Nate Perkins Nathan Perkins. Uh, no, I don't I think, believe I, think, I don't believe I've ever heard I, of him. Oh, I think you'd love him. Oh my gosh, you'd love him to death. Oh, I'll send you a link on Facebook after this is over. All right, great. 
Yeah. All right, Noah. Uh, nice talking to you. I'll talk to you later. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, man. I guess we're done. Yeah, it was wonderful talking to you, dude. Uh, thanks for taking time to, well, come on my podcast. My pleasure. Yeah, hopefully we'll do it again some more time. Uh-huh. All right, man. Uh, well, okay, folks, that's the end of the podcast. Uh, uh, if you want uh, to know more about me, check out my official website, garrettshelke.tumblr.com. Hit me up on Facebook. Twitter at Garrett Schalke. You can find this podcast at uh, God, let's see, iHeartRadio, Pandora now, Spotify, Internet Archive, a shit ton of places. And uh, that's it. Thanks again, Noah, for coming on. And uh, thank you, folks, for listening. Here is the outro song. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's on my mind Wishing times would change, it's on my mind like I gotta find my way, I gotta find mine Wishing times would change, it's on my mind like So I'm just sitting by the window, watch the wind blow Ain't with the games, but you see my wins low Tryna control my lane, but it's not Nintendo Damn, my ends low, swim my dollars limbo Slow the tempo up, now I don't know what As I watch a brother pass in that Benzo truck I'm in that hoopty, riding with my window stuck Still got groupies, shawty know that I'm next up She won't do me, and do me over again It depends if she let me do her and a friend See, I tend to defend my dark side I sin now and then, but my heart it rounds from within Hard times make a man Rough times make an end Life is a bitch And I'm just trying to make amends As I watch the people pass From my window sill Steady wonder why this thing's so ill I can't win, damn Wish the times would change It's on my mind like I gotta find my way I gotta find mine Wish the times would change, it's on my mind like I see an old head begging for change From way up here, I'm just begging the same Looking down on the clouds, I'm just begging for rain Calm down, watch me out, I'm just tired of pain It's all a game, so I'm searching for the cheat code Repo my drive, I'm on a detour Bumpy road at times, I still endo Blow out the cloud, I'm on that endo Spill it out, I let it flow until it hit the Holy Ghost Wraith in my view, I overflow for the dose See, I'm aiming for the gold, the fame will let you overdose So I get over those silly hoes and rope dose Got you trapped in the hope that some days Serving all this cane will get you touching sun rays So I stick to my QP's quality product Smoking what you thought of, spitting that broad That's while I'm here Wish the times would change, it's on my mind like I gotta find my way, I gotta find my Wish the times would change, it's on my mind like I gotta find my way, I gotta find my Wish the times would change, wish the times would change I gotta find my way, I gotta find my Wish the times would change, wish the times would change